Uh, my name is Taryn Hart, and I'm with Occupied Media, and I blog at plutocracyfiles.com. My name is Bill Black. I'm an associate professor of economics and law at the University of Missouri at Kansas City, a white-collar criminologist, and a former financial regulator. I blog at New Economic Perspectives, and you can follow me at William K. Black on Twitter. Well, I guess that we can just get started. I had just talked to economist John Quiggin. I just posted it, and he surprisingly was the first person um, who I'd come across who uh, made an argument against criminal prosecutions, which surprised me in um, the Wall Street context. Uh, and so I guess that's what we need to talk about is whether there's been criminal activity, I think your position has been clear that you think that there has been widespread criminal activity, and um, then whether there, sh whether there should be prosecutions, um, whether that's something that we should pursue and why. Sure. Uh, is it his position that there isn't criminality? I or think that we shouldn't. I think he prosecute it. Well, I think he kind of suggested both. So his first, what he said is he thinks that in fact the things that you know, you know, there's some criminals such as Madoff and there's a few criminals, but for the most part, you know, what's so bad is that it wasn't criminal, what people say at Goldman Sachs was doing. And so he made an argument that there wasn't criminality. And then he also made an argument, and again, these are very brief. I don't want to pin too much on Professor Quiggin because I really like him, but it gives me a good jumping off spot. Um, and he, then he also said, and if you look at the dot com, where the dot com crash, we did have criminal prosecutions, and what did that? And that really didn't get us anything. That really did wasn't a, a good use of our efforts, I suppose. Okay. Those were his arguments, so I figured that was a reasonable jumping off point for speaking with you. In fact, on his site, somebody said you need to talk to William Black, <laughs> and I said, oh, I'm interviewing him, you know, soon. So we will. Okay. So. Um, how do we know whether criminality has occurred? Mm -hmm. How do we present it in court so that we can get convictions or favorable results in civil suits and enforcement actions? We first explain to people how an honest bank would operate, and then we show why what they did at this particular bank makes no sense for an honest bank, but makes a lot of sense for an entity engaged in fraud. And in this context, there are many different kinds of things we call in criminology control frauds. Those are frauds by the people who control seemingly legitimate organizations and use them as a weapon to defraud others. Mm -hmm. I'm going to concentrate on the financial sphere where the weapon of choice is accounting. So th there is for a lender a four ingredient recipe for maximizing accounting control fraud. It's pretty straightforward. First ingredient, grow like crazy. Second, make really, really crappy loans, but at a premium yield. Third, have extreme leverage. That just means a lot of debt compared to your equity. And four, put aside only trivial reserves for the inevitable losses that could be coming. If you do those four things, you are mathematically guaranteed in the short run to report not just profits, but record profits. Mm. George Akerlof and Paul Romer called this the sure th thing. And this sure thing produces three things that are actually sure things. First, it produces the record short-term fictional income. Second, it produces incredibly large executive compensation. And third, if you think about the recipe again, it is the perfect recipe for causing devastating actual losses. Mm -hmm. Now, honest banks, of course, wouldn't be deliberately be making crummy loans and not setting aside reserves for those losses because that would guarantee that the bank would fail and an honest bank doesn't operate in that fashion. We also have things that we call in criminology markers of fraud. These are things that make no sense for, again, an honest lender. So one of the markers for fraud is appraisal fraud. 
an honest lender would never inflate the appraisal because the appraisal, of course, is of the security property, the collateral, mm -hmm. and that's your great protection against loss. So when you see large numbers of inflated appraisals, that is always an indication of fraud, and it's always an indication of fraud from the lender's side of the table because mm -hmm. the borrower can't inflate appraisals, but lenders can and do quite easily by uh, appraisal shopping. And that creates what we call in economics a Gresham's dynamic in which bad ethics drives good ethics out of the marketplace. Another marker for this kind of fraud, accounting control fraud by a lender, is if they make loans that they know have to produce overall losses. And that's what the liar's loan is all about. Mm -hmm. A liar's loan involves no underwriting as to the borrower's real income. If you do that, we have lots of experience that you will make so many loans that will cause so many losses that you will fail and you'll fail catastrophically. Mm -hmm. So honest lenders don't make liar's loans. Well, okay, how often did this occur? How often did these frauds occur in this crisis? Was it trivial or was it a driving force in the crisis? We have pretty good statistics on this. The FBI warns in September 2004 that there is an epidemic of mortgage fraud, their words, mm. and that it will cause a financial crisis, again, their word, unless it's contained. Let me emphasize that date again. 2004, this warning was already out. In 2006, the industry, this is the lenders industry, this is the trade association of the perps, mm. hires an anti-fraud specialty group called MARI, and that reports in writing to every mortgage lender in the United States virtually the following three things. First, this kind of loan, which the euphemism is stated income or alt A, mm -hmm. is, and I'm quoting again, an open invitation to fraudsters. Second, the incidence of fraud, in other words, how common is fraud in this kind of loan, is 90%, nine zero. Virtually all of them are fraudulent. And third, these loans deserve the term that the industry uses behind closed doors, which is liar's loans. Mm. Okay, so we know that this kind of loan would never be made by an honest firm. Honest firms don't make loans that are 90% fraudulent, and nobody made them make this kind of loan. They decided on their own that they wanted it. Well, why? So that there'd be no paper trail that they were inflating the borrower's income, right? Again, an intentional fraud, and one that the Financial Housing Finance Administration, in complaints, has said was deliberate fraud. Okay, So those are civil complaints filed by a federal agency against most of the largest banks in America. Okay, but we still have to ask, how many liar's loans were there? And again, we have decent information on that. By 2006, roughly one out of every three loans made in America was a liar's loan. Mm. That means in the ballpark of two million fraudulent loans by 2006 in that year alone. Mm. And in earlier years, over a million. We also know what happened after the warnings by the FBI and after the warnings by the industry's own anti-fraud specialists went out to virtually every mortgage lender. They massively increased the number of liar's loans, and they made those liar's loans steadily worse by what we call layered risk. In other words, they threw every insane thing possible on, and why not? They all knew that the loans were going to fail anyway. But by reducing the interest rate initially 
the, the, they delayed the inevitable time of reckoning. So what happens when one third of all loans by 2006 are liar's loans? Well, those are the, in economics jargon, the marginal loan in the marketplace. This is what drove the financial bubble to hyperinflate and extend its life for several years. And it is the massively hyperinflated financial bubbles that produces things like the Great Recession. So far from being a distraction or a few rotten uh, apples in a barrel, we have good evidence that the liar's loans were endemically fraudulent, that they were made by fraudulent entities to enrich their senior officers, that they drove the hyperinflation of the bubble, extended its life for several years, and were a leading factor in producing this crisis. So as to the first argument, this is something in which we have good information and it's been almost entirely ignored by economists. It's hard to find a single economist who even acknowledges the 2004 or the 2006 warnings. There are a few economists that uh, admit that liars' loans largely drove the bubble in the late stage and produced the catastrophic losses, but virtually none that put it all together and say, oh, <laughs> my God, I've just described a massive uh, epidemic of accounting control fraud. Let's go to the second point that the person has, and that is, should we do anything about it? Should we allow people to loot with impunity who are elites? I would argue that's a very bad solution. In the savings and loan crisis, our agency made well over 10,000 criminal referrals against the most elite frauds that drove that crisis. And I would remind people that the National Commission that looked into the causes of that crisis said, and I'm quoting again, at the typical large failure, fraud was invariably present. There we made the referrals very high quality. We worked with the FBI and the Justice Department to prioritize the absolutely most elite cases. It was called the top 100 list of the worst savings and loans. That translated to somewhere around 500 to 700 elite individuals represented by the best criminal defense lawyers in the world. We got a 90% conviction rate. And so the great bulk of the over 1,000 felony convictions that we got in cases designated as major by the Justice Department were the most elite participants. In the current crisis, in the lead up to it, the federal regulatory agencies, the banking agencies, destroyed their criminal referral units, eliminated them. So our agency, the Office of Thrift Supervision, which had made more than 10,000 criminal referrals in the savings and loan crisis again, made zero criminal referrals in this crisis. Mm -hmm. The Office of the Comptroller of the Currency, which regulates the largest national banks, made zero or three criminal referrals, depending on the source that you believe. If it made three, they were trivial. Mm -hmm. The Federal Reserve made three criminal referrals all unimportant to the overall crisis. The FDIC doesn't release the number, but it's extremely low and doesn't appear to have identified any of the major frauds. So what happens when you don't respond to the frauds? In the savings and loan crisis, the crisis was uh, led by a wave of deregulation and desupervision in 1982. By 1983, there was a new chairman of the agency, and despite both Republicans and Democrats, who were virulent opponents of what we did, we aggressively re-regulated the industry, contained that crisis so that it caused no recession at all, it cost a huge amount of money, $150 billion, but of course, compared to this crisis, where the household sector alone in America lost 11 
trillion dollars. A trillion is a thousand billion. The savings and loan crisis was contained precisely because people took fraud seriously, identified the markers of fraud, allowed us to prioritize those institutions for early closure, and we also figured out their Achilles heel. And that was that second and first elements working together of the, of the fraud recipe. We restricted growth, which killed all of the frauds. Here, when we ignore fraud, we allow these crises to become global in scope, causing great recessions here, a completely unresolved crisis in Europe, as people can see, what's happening in Greece right now, but also Portugal, Ireland, Spain, Italy, and Iceland. Now, if you have a world in which the most elite individuals, the 1%, in fact, the 1,000th of the 1%, the 400 wealthiest families, about 40% of them get their wealth from finance. If you allow them to become wealthy through fraud, and you allow them to defraud America, defraud much of the rest of the world, cause a great recession, cost 10 million people their job, cause $11 trillion in losses, and that's just in the household sector, and say, we're going to let you do that with impunity, then you guarantee a future of crony capitalism, mm. complete rule by the 1%, and a series of recurrent, intensifying financial crises. It is these frauds that are the great massive job killers. It is these accounting control frauds that are the weapons of mass destruction of wealth in the world. And the idea that we should do nothing, hold them not in the least accountable for their frauds. Yes, I, I definitely agree. Um... You know, I think that when people talk about the 1% versus the 99%, which has obviously been a big um, rallying cry of our movement, they th some people think in terms of economic uh, distribution of wealth, but I think it really is more about the fact that the 1% has completely captured the political system and is now above the rule of law, essentially. Right. That we've created that we no longer, which is the basis of our democracy, the idea that we're, you know, a nation of laws and not of men and all of these statements of our founders. Glenn Greenwald just wrote a book about it. Um, and so, I mean, I think criminal prosecutions are extremely important from that. Just 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 in terms of respect of the rule of law. I mean, we're now building kind of one precedent after another where we have a two-tiered justice system where one set of rules applies to the 99% and one set of rules applies to the 1%. So I think that that's something, the, the idea that there needs to be accountability, I think I sense is something that's really driving this movement. Yeah, we see the three things as coming together, economics, democracy, and morality. And the current system tears down all three of them. There's a very conservative French economist from long time ago, Bastiat, but his warning is captures this. When plunder becomes a way of life, he said, a rule of law develops that makes it legal to plunder mm -hmm. and a system of morality develops that celebrates plunder. And that's the ultimate loss uh, when you get into that situation. I tell people I have no difficulty explaining our crisis to somebody from Indonesia mm -hmm. because they know all about crony capitalism. But uh, so this is a simultaneous assault, this wave of fraud on our ethics, on our democracy, and our economy. And the idea that this represents the productive class is a sick joke. Mm. These are the leading destroyers of wealth 
in America and employment in America. And if they're not stopped, they'll turn the country into something that is terrible even for them. Is there a, it, so is it too late? Have, do we still have the ability to claw back the money, to prosecute people? It's not too late at all. In fact, I tell people if we had looked back in 1986, you might have said the same thing. There had been virtually no prosecutions by that time. Mm. You had both major parties um, strongly supportive of the worst of the frauds. So when we re-regulated the savings and loan industry, which again mm -hmm. began in November 1983, we did it over the intense opposition of the Reagan administration. In fact, the phrase re-regulator was their greatest swear word they mm -hmm. could think of to use against us. We also did it against the Office of Management and Budget, which actually threatened to make a criminal referral against the head of our agency on the ground that we were closing too many insolvent savings and loans. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't think you've noticed that problem recently with uh, regulators being too aggressive in closing insolvent uh, banks. We did it over the opposition of a majority of the members of the House of Representatives who co-sponsored a resolution telling us not to go forward with re-regulation. We went forward over the opposition of the incredibly powerful Speaker of the House, James Wright, who referred to me because I was leading at the staff level the re-regulation as the, he referred to me as the red-headed SOB and tried very hard to get me fired and got other prominent uh, regulators fired successfully. Mm -hmm. We did it over this opposition of the five U.S. senators that Charles Keating recruited by the way, using Alan Greenspan as his lobbyist, to intervene on behalf of the most notorious fraud in the savings and loan crisis, mm -hmm. Charles Keating's and his Lincoln Savings, where those five senators tried to block us from taking regulatory action against a massive violation of the rules. The Reagan administration actually tried to give power over our regulatory agency to Charles Keating. Our regulatory agency was run by three presidential appointees and the administration attempted to appoint two members supported by Charles Keating. Hmm. Can you imagine how big the savings and loan debacle would have become if the federal regulatory agency had become controlled by the worst fraud? We did it over the opposition of every economist who spoke on the subject, all of whom said we were insane, didn't we understand regulation was the great evil, deregulation was the great answer to all problems. Mm -hmm. We did it over the opposition of, the almost complete opposition of the business press. And our only real ally uh, was uh, then Federal Reserve Chairman Volcker. And even he, I think, would say that he probably wasn't as vocal as he would have liked to have been in retrospect. So if you could do all of those things over the opposition of all of those people, it's much easier to fix the problem now. Right. I mean, but there's two things. There's the criminal prosecutions and then there's the re-regulation, right? So, or... Right. So those are and, and the issue and part of the issue with the criminal prosecution is whether we could get any of the money back, whether we could claw any of the money back. Right. But all of these things are related. You can't have successful criminal prosecutions against large numbers of elite bankers unless you have the very aggressive, high priority support of the regulator regulators. Right. We have to serve as the Sherpas in both senses to get you to the top of the Himalayas. And that's what prosecuting these elites is like. They Again, they have the best criminal defense lawyers in the world. So we, the regulators, have to do the heavy lifting. And in this context, that means we have to do the investigative work. Mm -hmm. And we have to serve as the trail guides. And so we're the ones who point and explain this is a control fraud. 
you need to go after the most senior people. This is why it isn't innocent activity. This is why it is fraudulent activity. All of that has ceased. So if you want effective re-regulation, and if you want effective prosecution, it all starts in the same place. You need new regulatory leaders. Mm -hmm. Overwhelmingly, the top banking regulators at this time, well, first, under the Bush administration, they were picked because they were the leading opponent of regulation in America. They were the anti-regulators, not the regulators. President Obama has left a number of these people in charge as actings. He has also appointed a whole series of people who were abject failures as regulators. Indeed, in some cases, he's promoted them. Mm -hmm. So Timothy Geithner was the president of the Federal Reserve Bank of New York. In that capacity, his principal task was to regulate the largest bank holding companies in the United States, the ones that went berserk through their frauds caused this crisis for the reasons that I've explained. He was a total failure as a regulator. In fact, he never even tried. In addition to being completely ineffective, he never even raised a warning about the crisis. What did President Obama do? Promote him and make him Treasury Secretary. Ben Bernanke was supposed to regulate of course, uh, the all kinds of banks and bank holding companies. On top of that, the Federal Reserve had unique authority in the United States under a law called HOEPA, which is Homeowners Equity Protection Act. And that act goes all the way back to 1994, allowed the Federal Reserve and only the Federal Reserve to regulate every mortgage lender in America. And that was critical because most of these liars' loans were made by entities that were not subject to federal regulation, except under this OEPA exception. And so Alan Greenspan's colleagues on the Fed went to him and begged him to use this authority, warned him about what was happening in these non-prime loans. And First, Greenspan refused, and then Bernanke refused to use this authority. It was only used finally in August 2008, and that was, of course, just a little late, since all such loans had basically died a year before. So what I'm saying is that um, Bernanke uniquely had the authority, as did his predecessor, Alan Greenspan, to prevent this crisis by preventing liar's loans. They refused to use the authority. So Ben Bernanke is a biggest regulatory disaster in history. You can, compl you know, maybe he's in a horse race with Alan Greenspan. Collectively, together, they were awful. Ben Bernanke is a partisan Republican. He was president of uh, chairman, uh, chairman President Bush's Council of Economic Advisors, and Obama reappointed him to run the Fed. Mm -hmm. So you take somebody who's a partisan member of the opposing party that's been a complete disaster, and you reappoint them. Um, it's just bizarre. We live in a world in which people are chosen as our top regulators on the basis that they will be most hostile to effective regulation. And then we supposedly see, see, regulation doesn't work. Well, you know, it's a self-fulfilling prophecy of failure when you put people in charge who are make sure that it will fail. So is there any move at this point to do anything about it? I mean, I know that the you know, I know that there had been some attor states' attorneys general who had resisted the settle the settlement, the 50-state settlement, and there had been some pressure on them, including the attorney general of New York. Um, is there is there anything? Is there any will to, I guess, uh, tackle any of these issues? You know, pursue any criminal prosecution? Do anything to get the American public's money back? <laughs> 
at the federal level, um, Geithner is intervening and Holder is intervening to prevent mm -hmm. any widespread prosecution of the systemically dangerous institutions, the largest 20 banks whose fraud caused this crisis. So the federal level is generally terrible. There is one exception, and that is the Federal Housing Finance Administration, the FHFA, which is the regulator of Fannie and Freddie, but also the conservator of Fannie and Freddie because they've failed. In its capacity as conservator, the FHFA, about six weeks ago, sued 17 of the largest banks in America and said, not only did you sell endemically fraudulent liar's loans to Fannie and Freddie, but you did so by making false representations and warranties. That's fraud. And the FHFA said, you left a paper trail that establishes that you knew that these were fraudulent and bad loans and deliberately misled us. Now, that removes any excuse that the administration has for not prosecuting. Mm -hmm. It makes a mockery of the claim that most of this stuff was legal. They found exactly the opposite. And by the way, this is with minimal investigation. The FHFA doesn't have the ability to convene a grand jury, didn't use the FBI as investigators, didn't have bank examiners investigating the facts. This is simply by doing a document discovery request and looking at those documents. So the Justice Department could produce a far more powerful case. And its refusal to do so is a violation of every principle of American just justice and will destroy America if it continues. The states have been far better than the federal government through their attorney generals. And again, they warned long and hard about this crisis coming. And again, the Federal Reserve ignored their warnings at hearings that were held uh, on uh, the non-prime loans. In particular, the attorney generals of New York, Delaware, California, but also to some extent Arizona and Nevada, have held out against these frauds. But I must tell you, we are coming up on what, according to all accounts, will be the most destructive act, single act against American justice. And that is the administration is pushing, the industry is pushing, and unfortunately, most of the state attorney generals are now willing to accept a trade in which we will get the equivalent from the industry perspective of chump change, some number of billions of dollars, which will go to some small percentage of the people who were defrauded in their home loans. And in return, we are supposed to give immunity to those massive frauds by these systemically dangerous institutions that caused this crisis, and we're supposed to never even investigate, never even make clear their frauds, so that the next time around, they won't have any kind of record, and they'll be able to do it with impunity again. If that happens, that will be essentially the formal surrender of the United States of America to crony capitalism. There is an op-ed, I'm sorry, a column by Gretchen Morganson, uh, mm -hmm. about this uh, in a very recent New York Times uh, that your viewers could look at as well with more details, but a, a number of us have written about this, the scandal of this proposed settlement. And and so the res there, there aren't any attorney generals that are resisting that, it doesn't look like? Is that what you're saying? No, at this point, uh, there are um, Schneiderman, uh, Attorney General of New York, Biden, uh, the Attorney General of Delaware, and the Attorney General of California at this point are all resisting, but they're under enormous pressure from the administration and its political arms 
to do the absolute worst thing. This should be a, a scandal of first level proportions. Notice that the Republicans are not exploiting this scandal. Mm -hmm. Think about that. I mean, they obviously detest President Obama. They would obviously love to slam him for anything and everything, whether it's meritorious or not. On this subject, they have been dead silent. Right. That's exactly right. Um, so what do you think our movement can do? Um, what would be, you know, I guess there's the ideal world and there's the real world. In the real world that we're in right now, what would be your priorities? Well, I would always put my priority in stopping the next crisis and in getting people to work um, in the current crisis. So mm -hmm. I would uh, immediately uh, order that no systemically dangerous institution could grow and that they would shrink within five years to a level where they would no longer pose a systemic risk to the safety of the world. That would be a very big deal in preventing a future crisis, too. I would immediately appoint new acting heads at virtually all of the regulatory agencies and the Department of Justice. So I would fire Holder, I would uh, fire uh, Geithner, and you can't fire um, Bernanke under the law, but you can ask for his resignation. And I would replace them with vigorous leaders with a track record of success. I would immediately reform executive compensation, which creates incredible perverse incentives. And I would clean up professional compensation and how that works in terms of the credit rating agencies, the outside auditors, the appraisers as such. My priorities uh, in dealing with the current crisis would be to get people employed. And so I would have uh, job guarantee programs. Right now, we pay people not to work when we have massive needs in America. So we have an obvious win-win of paying people to work mm -hmm. and do productive things. I would use the NGOs. Uh, as a way to get people to work on effective projects that would help people very rapidly. I would adopt revenue sharing, which was part of the proposed stimulus bill originally, because this crisis in state and local governments is insane. You need to be increasing the role of government to come out of a great recession. Instead, we are rapidly shrinking. We're firing teachers. We're firing police officers all kinds of other public employees when they're most needed. So that's insane. I would stop that. I would stop the foreclosures, frauds immediately, and I would go to a program for the people who clearly cannot afford their homes in which they become renters, um, and for others that could afford their home uh, with modest reductions of principal, I would do that. On the criminal sphere, uh, the priority is stopping this obscene uh, immunity grant to the most elite frauds. That should be a major effort. Uh, it should be completely bipartisan. It has nothing to do with party or anything else. This is just a total obscenity. There is absolutely no argument in favor of giving immunity to the frauds. The idea that you create economic stability by giving immunity to the frauds who caused the crisis is so insane that anybody proposing that really should be evaluated for psychiatric needs. <laughs> Those are my priorities. Right. And just with that last point, the argument that's being made is that we need to settle this. We need to give them immunity because it's creating too much uncertainty. And so the idea is, right, so the idea is, if we immunize them, that we're going to somehow, you know, make things more stable when in fact, I think what you're arguing, what you're saying is that creating a, a situation in which they can do these things with impunity actually creates systemic risk. 
Well, yeah, and systemic risk of a very particular kind. Mm -hmm. The only risk is when the economy will blow up again. Right. There's no doubt that it will blow up again if you keep the system. And there's no doubt that it'll blow up worse because of it. The idea that you can leave frauds in power. I mean, would they make the same deal with Al Qaeda? Mm -hmm. You know, they we're suffering from uncertainty on, on this. So if we just immunize uh, Al Qaeda, uh, it'll all go well. I don't think so. Right. Uh, I had recently just talked with uh, Josh Zinner, who works for an organization called NEDAP, which is in New York City, and they work in some of the neighborhoods, um, such as South Jamaica, Queens, and neighborhoods in Brooklyn, which which were, as he said, kind of ground zero for these predatory lenders who were doing these insane loans. And he you know, affirmed much of what you're saying, that back in the 90s, when they were watching all of these things come into existence, it's very clear um, that these predatory lenders who, and then he explains how these predatory lenders were then purchased by major banking institutions. So countrywide, I think is the example that we all know of, but he named some other specific predatory lenders that were purchased by Citibank and purchased by all of these various places, um, that the loans that they were doing were meant to blow up within a couple of years. And then what they did is went in and refinanced for years and years and years. They called it, um, and I'm not going to remember the term, um, oh, loan flipping, um, that they would go in and refinance all of these loans. So, you know, and he said that they were warning on the ground about all of this fraud for years and that it was very clear even from their perspective, just looking at these neighborhoods that were so hard hit, which were predominantly African-American working class communities um, that they were warning on the ground that, that, that it was systemic, that there was no chance it wasn't systemic when they were looking at whole neighborhoods being devastated by these loans. So it's clear that the warnings were coming from a lot of different areas. It's also clear that, that everybody knew what was going on. There was kind of this claim early on that made me very suspicious about how everything was too complicated and nobody knew what was going on. Um, and it's clear that, in fact, people, everybody did know what was going on. Yeah, I can confirm a number of these things. Yes, it was uh, overwhelmingly advocates for the poor that instead of saying, oh, don't look at this, don't look at this, we're saying quite the opposite to the Fed. They were saying this is an enormous problem area. It's rife with predatory lending. You should look. So mm -hmm. instead of consumer and housing advocates being the great villains in this piece, they're the people who in many cases tried to warn the Fed, again, to use its authority under HOEPA to prevent this crisis. Indeed, I can confirm in particular – uh, aspects of the timing. In 1990 and 1991, it's a long time ago, liars loans and subprime loans became fairly common mm. in one part of the country, Orange County, California, where all good frauds originate. <laughs> we were the regional savings and loan regulators, and we killed that by normal supervisory means because it was obvious that such loans had to end in disaster, and it was obvious that such loans were targeting the least financially sophisticated folks and minorities, and not just African Americans, but in particular Latinos, uh, mm -hmm. especially Latinos for, uh, who were not as strong in English, because after all, you're presenting documents in a foreign language that they can't read. So what did those frauds do? Well, the, the leading one gave up its federal charter, gave up its deposit insurance voluntarily for the sole purpose of escaping our jurisdiction because we would have no jurisdiction over them once they gave up their federal charter. They founded AmeriQuest, which became the most notorious of the frauds and predatory lenders. And their leading competitor was another husband-wife team 
that we had removed and prohibited from the savings and loan industry as well. So they went to this area that, that had no federal regulation, mortgage banking. Mm. We had, however, been able to make, in addition, referrals for race uh, discrimination and discrimination on the basis of ethnicity. And so the Justice Department went after AmeriQuest. So that's the second strike. Whereupon AmeriQuest promised it would never do anything bad again. Whereupon they immediately went back to the same old stuff. This time they were sued by 49 state attorney generals, plus the attorney general of the District of Columbia, plus the Federal Trade Commission. And if you ask why not all 50, it's because Virginia at that time actually had some real regulation. And so AmeriQuest did no business in Virginia because its whole purpose was to escape any kind of effective regulation. Okay, so this 49 state AG, that's the third strike. This is the third group of investigators to come in and find massive problems at AmeriQuest. Whereupon AmeriQuest signs a deal um, that settles the case for hundreds of millions of dollars in fines. And the head of AmeriQuest, Roland Arnal, is promptly made the U.S. ambassador to the Netherlands, because that's the kind of guy we want representing our nation. Why? Because he was the leading political contributor to George W. Bush. Mm. Now that's bad, but that's politics. What comes next is even worse and even more relevant to this crisis because two entities rush to acquire AmeriQuest. Remember, AmeriQuest has a thousand employees, most of whom every day of the week committed fraud and in particular sought out minorities to engage in predatory lending against them. Hmm. And Washington Mutual and Citicorp said, that's the kind of folks we want working for us. They acquired AmeriQuest operations, brought in the fraudulent employees, and began fraudulent lending of their own in massive amounts. And you are quite right, and your sources are quite right. Precisely because these liars' loans were so large, because they grew massively from 2003 through 2007, they hyperinflated the financial bubble. And if you inflate the bubble, you can make the bad loans disappear. And you can prevent, you can defer the loan loss recognition by simply refinancing the loan. Right. In the trade, this is called a rolling loan gathers no loss. Right, exactly. So it all really didn't come completely crashing down until the housing bubble starts to deflate and there's no ability to uh, refinance the various loans that, you know, had now, you know, well, I mean, actually, you know, my source, as I said, Josh Zinner said that many of these loans were not successful from the beginning. It wasn't just the case of having you know, some kind of hidden adjustable rate, which some of them did have as well. But many of them were absolutely unsustainable from the get-go. So oh, No, the typical, the typical liar's loan was unsustainable from the get-go and could only survive as long as the bubble hyperinflated. And it was, of course, inevitable that the bubble could not continue. Right, exactly. Well, um, I will provide links to some of your pieces as well as, uh, is it Gretchen Morganson? Is that? Yes. Okay. As well as her recent piece, we'll find that. Um, I know she did some really great work early on about Brooksley Bourne and um, the early warnings that were given to regulators. So she's done some great work at the New York Times regarding this issue. Um, and also, um, should we be should should we be pressuring the various attorneys generals not to 
Subtle. Absolutely. Don't cave. If New York, California, and Delaware stay strong, uh, the Attorney General of uh, California is Ms. Harris, uh, then this cannot occur because those three states are, are so large in, in terms of their corporate roles. Great. So I'll also provide links on how to contact the attorneys generals of those states. So thank you. Thank you so much for agreeing to talk with us. I know that um, you've been out participating in marches with our movement and you went to New York City uh, and Zuccotti Park. Um, and, 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 what, and what's been your impression so far of that? And to our local one in Kansas City, and I'm going uh, November 5th to be in L.A. Uh, at the uh, kitchen uh, occupied by OWS there. So, of course, the uh, impression one gets is uh, finally some people who are outraged. Um, but, you know, there are innumerable things people are interested in uh, at uh, OWS. So, uh, you know, it's fascinating walking through and see the, seeing the number of causes uh, that people are interested in uh, as well. Great. Well, thank you so much for taking the time, and we will um, get this posted. And if there's any other links you want us to include, let us know. Well, to our new economic perspectives, as I say, and simply to the Twitter uh, thing, but we have lots of good resources on uh, new economic perspectives for uh, uh, OWS. Great. Well, thank you so much for taking the time and and, and hope we identify as uh, uh, econ for the 99 using the uh, numbers. Oh, Our great. Friends. Great. Very good. Thank you so much. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.